hundred people in a meeting here, but uh, it's a mix of faculty plus students. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Nilesh sir, uh, with your permission, we are start. Um, uh, Teja, I'm sorry, I just checked the time. Can we wait for three more minutes? Because we had said we'll start at 6.30. Yeah. We'll start in the next two minutes. Sure, sir. Dr. Reddy, good evening. Good evening, sir. Nice meeting you virtually. Yeah, good to see you. I mean, good to connect with you after a long time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we are good to go. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. A very good evening uh, to one and all present here. We at the Goa Business School, in association with the Fomento Resources, have been organizing a series of lectures for the management students and management experts in and around Goa. So this activity had started in the year 2000. 18, and we named it as the Fomento Lecture Series. We had the privilege of hearing some of the eminent experts in the areas of HR, finance, marketing, entrepreneurs as a part of this lecture series. To name of you, we had Mr. Sanjeev Hegde Desai, who is a programmer of Google. We had Mr. Sukhvinder Singh, director at Singh Sports Ventures, and many more. And today we have with us our own Goan industrialist, Sri Srinivas Dempo. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you, sir, and be a part of our Fermento Lecture Series. I now request our Dean, Professor Sudarshan, to welcome the gathering. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Thetja. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, Fomento lecture series. My special welcome to Sri Srinivas Dembo, Chairman Dembo Group, and uh, Chief Guest of today's function, and also Speaker of the Day. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce uh, Goa Business School. Goa Business School was established by amalgamating the departments of management, commerce, economics, and computer science. The amalgamation was done with certain specific objectives and the main objective was to reap the economies of scale in knowledge production and dissemination. The GBS is the largest school in the Goa University. It runs seven programs and has around 45 full-time faculty members with a student strength of around 950. GBS aims to discover the synergy in the related disciplines and showcase the strength in research and teaching. The number of publications and the PhDs produced have shown a rapid increase in the last two years. The faculty members have undertaken various research projects, consultancy, etc., and have made a mark at the national and international levels. Our students are also doing well. And they are around, I mean, they are in various places around the world and doing very well. Uh, thank you very much. I once again uh, welcome uh, Sri Srinivas Tempo and over to uh, Ms. Thetcha. Thank you, sir. I now request Ms. Sunaina from MBA department to introduce our chief guest for today. A very good evening to everyone, Kalija. 
It gives me immense pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for today, Sri Srinivas Tempo. Sri Srinivas Tempo is the chairman of the Tempo Group of Companies, having diversified interest in industries such as Calculant Petroleum, Shipbuilding, Food Processing, Real Estate, and Newspaper Publishing. He has been the chairman of the Western Region of the Confederation of Indian Industry. He was appointed chairman of Automobile Corporation of Goa Limited, a Tata Group company. In 2013, Mr. Dempo was named Honorary Vice Consul of Kiki in Goa. He was appointed as Additional Director of Kiriosa Brothers Limited on 25th May 2021. Mr. Dempo has a long association with football, having patronized a, a premier football club. He was named among the 15 most influential people in Indian sports in the 2010 Sports Illustrated Power List as President and Chairman of Tempo Sports Club. Mr. Dempo is on the Executive Council of Goa University. Besides being associated with a number of non-governmental organizations performing human service to society, such as the Charles Korea Foundation and the Goa Cancer Society, who is president here. Mr. Dempo continues his multi-generational engagement with Goan society, covering institutions and programs of higher education, cultural enrichment, environmental conservation, sport, sporting excellence, and affirmative action under Dempo Charities Trust and Basantra Dempo Education and Research Foundation. He was elected as the Senior Vice President of AMA on 27th September 2021. Mr. Dempo earned his Bachelor's and Master's degrees from the University of Mumbai in 1990 and 1992 respectively and later took a Master of Science degree in Industrial Administration and Finance from Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA in 1995. In 2019, he was elected as a member on their board of trustees. In 2020, he received the Tepper Achievement Award in recognition of his influential roles as chairman and managing director of the Tempo Group and in professional associations and civic organizations in India. With these few words, I would now like so to address the gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Selena, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sudarshan, for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's indeed a great privilege and a pleasure to address uh, students and faculty of the Goa Business School of the Goa University. Uh, I have been privileged enough to be a part of many executive councils in the Goa University and I'm completely up to date with a lot of good work that they're doing. Uh, specifically uh, with the business school, I know I have, we have uh, employed many a students from the Goa Business School. I find their caliber very high. So I must compliment uh, Dr. Sudarshan and everybody, all the faculty members and of course students who have excelled in the field of management. Uh, through the Goa Business School. Uh, I have also been a part and an alumni till my second year of the Goa University. I did do my first year and second year BCom at the Dempo Commerce College of uh, Commerce and Economics, SS Dempo College. And uh, that was uh, very much still a part of the Goa University and have, you know, been benefited by the kind of excellence in education that the university provides. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. Uh, to be talking to all of you. I know many people in the audience. So my greetings to all of them and thanks for being part of this uh, uh, debate. Uh, I am not here to propagate uh, any gyan to you. Uh, I am learning as much as you are. Uh, these have been very, very testing times. And uh, when Nilesh asked me, actually I must thank Nilesh for being so persistent to ask me to speak. And I'm thankful to him. And, uh, you know, when he asked me to choose a topic, I, I looked into various topics and I said, where can I share my learning experience the most? Because with all humility, uh, you know, as I am an MBA student, you, you all are MBA students or faculty members. And I have nothing more to teach you. 
we, we all learn the same basics. But uh, running a business uh, which is deep rooted in the Goa business ethos and uh, which is part of the Goa ecosystem and uh, facing such turbulent times and facing such uncertain times, uh, I thought that it would be rather useful, particularly to students who are the future leaders, uh, to at least uh, exchange thoughts with them and views with them as to what went through my mind when businesses really became not only zero profits, but zero revenue. You know, uh, remember last year, uh, 26th of March, uh, 2020, when uh, there was such chaos, such uncertainty, uh, such nervousness, such insecurity, uh, that, uh, you know, for a leader who is at the top and who has very little support in terms of sideways support, there is a lot of support beneath, sideways support or up support, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to gauge uh, how to navigate these uncharted territories. And it's not only COVID-19. I'm, I'm not saying only about COVID-19. Look at the geopolitics of today. I was sitting in my office today and I was try trying to take a view on the price of oil. Uh, you know, one of our businesses, which is in the Petco business, that is a listed entity called Goa Carbon. We depend uh, a lot on a raw material which comes from the oil refineries. And uh, with the Ukraine crisis, it's becoming so difficult, uh, you know, to predict the future prices that all your three year and five year plans that you learn in an MBA school are put to the winds. You know, I'm virtually saying this and I'm practically saying this because this is where the uncertainty lies and this is where the challenges lie. But I think, you know, management education has changed a lot. I became an MBA student in 1993, so it's been more than 25 years. And I'm sure you all must be updated with a lot of the new things that are happening, you know, including use of technology, including how AI is affecting businesses, including what new skills a manager is required to have. So you will be much more well informed than me. But at the end of the day, a business school has to change its curriculum to suit uh, the needs of a new manager. And uh, one of the important, I don't know whether Goa Business School does this, but one of the most important topics uh, that should be pursued is leadership. I think all of you all are potential leaders in the future. Uh, Indians are bright. They are very hardworking, uh, you know, and I, I have a different view when people criticize the Indian education system. If Indian education system was not good, then the top 10 managers of the world would not have been Indians who rule IT companies. They all studied in Indian institutions. They did not study in Harvard and Stanford. They at least did their bachelors in Indian institutions and then went to pursue higher studies. So there must be something good that uh, the likes of Satya Nadella and you know many others, uh, Sundar Pichai and all, who studied in, in schools. I mean, you know, some of them have studied in government schools uh, in the primary level. And then they worked hard and then they went ahead and, you know, they had the guts to dream. And I think, uh, you know, they are, they are looking and they are ruling at some of the largest corporations of the world, uh, where probably the combined GDP is more than India. So what really matters is leadership and how this leadership evolves, whether it's leadership of the nation, whether it's leadership of the state, whether it's leadership of a corporate, whether it's leadership of the university, whether it's leadership of a government department. I think all leaders should have certain traits. And what I'll try and do is share uh, some of the thoughts that I have, you know, and these are not rocket science. Please don't think that I'm uh, more knowledgeable than you. Uh, that's why I said that I would like to share certain basic things that I feel have helped me to tide over the crisis that we recently experienced and we are still doing it. Uh, it's it's uh, today technology is taking every single part of the business. And that's creating a lot of uncertainty amongst the minds of managers, amongst the minds of people. Uh, there is a lot of emotional upheaval. Uh, I'll give you an instance when I said on the 26th of March, 2020, when the Honorable Prime Minister announced that there's going to be a national lockdown, but everything's going to close down. You know, you can't go to office, you can't start your factories. So you can imagine what could go through a mind of a leader, somebody like me, who has thousands of people employed, you know, 
uh, what will it look like? Will uh, will this lockdown continue for the next one year? Continue for the next six months? How are we going to earn revenues? So forget profits. How are we going to earn revenues? How are we going to pay the government taxes? How are we going to pay, uh, you know, our employees' dues? Because these are the most important stakeholders. Government, which runs the social security system of the country through the taxes paid by all of us as income taxpayers and the employees who work so hard to give you the return on your investment as employees of the company. So this went through our mind. And I said, if this is going through my mind, what is it that must be going in the minds of my employees? Because they will be even more insecure than me. Because at least I have to only worry about them, but they have to worry about themselves. So that was the difference. And you know, something very interesting that I came up that, you know, when we find ourselves in uncharted territories, with a crisis like COVID-19 or any crisis, we start realizing its impact on our families, communities, businesses, and the world at large. This unknown can be very unknown and fear-inducing if we let it in. So it can also be, but as an entrepreneur, as a leader, you have to be a die-hard optimist. You have to be a die-hard optimist. You have to be of a positive mind frame. And one thing that you, you remember, simple basics in life, what goes down has to come up. Of course, the, also the reverse, what goes up also has to come down. And one classic case, if all of you all remember, on 26th March, if all of us had to buy stocks on that day, when the stock market collapsed to 29,000 Sensex, and today, exactly the stock market is at 58,000 Sensex. You would have doubled your money in less than two years. So I'm just giving you, I'm not trying to say that you should do it, but I'm just giving you an example that if you are a diehard optimist and you believe that India is a great country, India will continue to grow at plus seven to eight percent. India is, is one of the economic superpowers. Indians are doing very well, not only in India, but overseas. Our standard of living is improving. If you look at our poverty baseline, the number of people upscaling that and, you know, crossing that poverty baseline. And if you look at the rising middle class, now all these are positive field factors saying that even if there's a crisis, there's an opportunity in the crisis. And as a leader, you need to take that in your stride. So I'm going to, you know, something very interesting. I read one of the quotes, which says in uncertain and turbulent times, Accepting that challenge is the only antidote to chaos, stagnation, and disintegration. Times change, problems change, technologies change, and people change. But leadership endures. So this is something that, you know, you have to remember. You know, one of the things that I was thinking, I remember, I think the lockdown happened on 26th of March. And on 25th of March, me and my family were sitting down for dinner at a, at a local restaurant. And we were all looking, you know, everybody was fine. And suddenly the guy who was serving us, he looked at his mobile and he became very tense, you know, and I could see the stress palpable on his face. I said, what has happened? Did we insult him? Did he do something wrong, which he's feeling guilty about? So when we saw, I asked him, I said, you know, what is it that has happened? Why are you looking so stressed and worried? He said, Sir, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have just been informed by our manager that the restaurants will be closed from tomorrow and we will be informed when they will reopen. So what I'm saying is, I'm not talking about the employee who went this. All of us went through that. I'm talking about his manager. I'm talking about the manager's boss. I'm talking about the leader. What must have gone through his mind when there is fear, when there's insecurity, when there's nervousness? A leader has to take control. A leader has to be empathic. A leader has to be emotionally ingrained with the employees. A leader, though, I was also fishing in uncharted territories. When I was talking to my employees, I could see the stress in their voice. But if I had demonstrated the same stress, matters would have been worse. You have to have the courage. You have to take the risk-taking ability. You have to show that you are there for them. Though you are equally at stress, you know that things are uncertain, you don't know how things are going to go, but you have to create that environment to give them confidence. 
so this is the first thing that i say that as a manager as a leader you have to be honest and transparent about the reality you find yourself in at the same time never ever say you know something that is not true your own managers your own people who work for you who work in your desk on the foundation of leadership what they expect is their leaders to be honest competent forward looking and inspiring if you don't show this you know how will you expect your employees to perform in that level of uncertainty where they don't know where their salaries are going to come from next month so i find that being honest and transparent about the reality you find yourself in is the most important thing because they look at authenticity from you and your eyes your expression your behavior your communication should all show this it's not the time to sugarcoat you know the reality has to be explained but at the same time some confidence building measures should be given to the employees and that's where your skill lies saying that look guys this is going to be temporary but we are all going to come out of it and i am there for you to see how we can navigate through this uncharted waters this will only not jeopardize your credibility as a leader otherwise your leadership credibility is at stake the second thing what i find always be deep rooted in your values and let them guide you every organization every individual it is a dna of an organization to have values for example at dempo group yes our main values is you know we need to take care of the community around us in whatever crisis mode that you are in you know people talk about csr being made mandatory i remember at least for the last 30 to 40 years even as a child our management the promoters made sure that always a percentage of the profit was devoted to the community around you you must be cognizant if only the community prospers the business prospers so that's why i am saying always be deep, deep, deep rooted in your values love the business that you are doing you know don't take money as the main motive i know as youngsters all of us feel we see the great valuation that the startup has achieved but those startup guys if you talk to them money is never a motive there's something beyond money of course money is important of course investments have to be recovered of course you have to get an roi on your investment but when you look after your stakeholders when you look after all the people your suppliers your customers your employees your community around you automatically the business does well and generates profit i'll tell you an instance in covid when covid happened you know most of our business suppliers were nervous they said sir we have given you credit all this while based on the credibility of your name we have given you credit because you dealt with us in a particular way we can't afford the credit anymore you know we have to do cash sale business for the simple reason that we need to pay our employees and i know that in such bad times we have to support each other we went we walked the extra mile and we say okay we had a 30 day credit period let's reduce it to 15 days these are solutions that a leader has to come up you know at the end of the day your suppliers your customers then we went reverse with our customers and we said that our suppliers are insisting because they are all small scale suppliers how do we take care of them you know it is our responsibility as a big company to take care of our small scale suppliers so we went to our buyers who are much bigger than us and we said can we request you to pay us a little faster to pay us a little more so that we could take care of this entire ecosystem so what i am saying is that if you re remain deeply rooted in your values and let those values guide you what i would say is a simple thing whenever you sit down if you're working for an organization if you're working or if you're studying write down your values and put it on your computer and whatever decision that you take you should be guided by those values saying that my for me my customer is very important i will not do, do shortcuts to make profits because a shortcut profit is a short term profit you know we have to look at long term and whether it's a crisis situation or not one should always focus on the long term benefit because then only your business will survive otherwise typically what happens is yes you do make money for the short term but at the end 
if your multi stakeholders don't support you if your employees don't support you if your suppliers don't support you if your buyers and customers don't support you how will you even run a business which is so ingrained in this whole multi stake approach so the second value the first i said was to be honest and transparent about reality have the guts to tell your employees what's the real situation in the company how you plan with their support their cooperation how you plan to overcome it and then lead walk the talk that's how i'll tell you an instance how we led and walked the talk as as a rule what i do is since i am the overall chairman of the group i allow my ceos to operate in a very independent manner and i typically believe ownership and management you must be learning in the in the corporate world or in you know management studies ownership and management should always be separated but what happened during covid times everybody started coming online and the hierarchies of managers disappeared you know uh, there are pros and cons for it but as a leader for me i had to take a call that i could have taken a call and said it's your baby i pay you don't disturb me only when my house is on fire you come back to me okay but what i realized is this is a crisis situation if mr dempo is not seen every day with the team you know what were the challenges we had to manage our supplies raw materials were not available there was a lockdown there were local lockdowns we had to manage government permissions all the factories were closed down then the state government said that you can apply you start applying and then we'll consider and there was all patchy information so when there's patchy information it's extremely unnerving and unsettling for an employee to say how will i deal with this situation i don't get proper information i have uncertainty whether the government will allow me i don't know when my raw material will come i don't know when my goods will leave from the factory i mean those are the challenges that we're facing and in those challenges if i didn't make myself available to my team okay what are my leadership capabilities though in the normal business sense i would not have interfered i would have thrown the challenge at the ceo and said run your business if there's any problem you come back to me but i made sure that entire month when i was on every call with every company of mine with the ceo and the team but what good happened was i got exposed to a cross line managers because because of technology and the usage of you know online methods overnight the hierarchies disappeared i had not seen some of the brightest people in my organization i saw the spark in their eyes i saw that they are willing to take up this challenge all they needed was a pat on the back from the owner and the employer saying that let's do this together and that's what was the the great thing about you know online the way we are now sitting and chatting with 100 people that i could face my managers which i had never seen some of them in my life other than meeting them socially across corridors in the elevators but i think that was something which was really really good the that's the third thing that i would say is be empathetic it's extremely important when people are experiencing some degree of insecurity and fear including our, me, me myself because at the end of the day nobody knew when this whole thing would start and even to some extent today we are uncertain we have gone through two or three variants of covid we hope that this has ended now you know but we need to be on guard you know businesses need to be on guard we have to say that if another calamity strikes strikes like this and forget covid if there's the, the the if there's an escalation of crisis of the ukraine war what do we what does it really mean for india and what does it really mean for our businesses so one has to be constantly on, on guard but that's where you have to have the bandwidth the patience to listen to your employees to address their fears to address their uncertainties to listen to their concerns that's what will give them the freedom of mind to really work hard and put all the hard work back and passion in the company because if they don't find answers and if the leader is vague then i don't think that he can do enough justice to the employees who have to do justice back to the company so i think being empathetic is the third thing that i would say is extremely important to run leadership challenges in turbulent times and the last is trust yourself i think the most important thing is you need to trust yourself 
and be there for the employees. Unless you trust yourself and unless you see that the business that you're running, earning, uh, I mean, running with passion, integrity, commitment, honor, hard work. Okay. If you don't believe yourself, then how do you expect your people to believe? So the, the self-belief and the trust, although it's very highly challenging in uncertain environments, you need to have the guts to dream. And these dreams have to be backed up by plans to make this dream a reality. I think we have all seen it during COVID times. We saw how the fluctuations happened, how the prices were coming down, then how it went up. So during those times, you had to do a lot of planning. You had to plan your cash flows because you had to have some cash powder ready for the next, what, 18 months, 20 months. You didn't know how long this whole thing. Fortunately, it came back much faster than what we thought. But yes, there were grave injustices to the people at the bottom of the pyramid. While the rich made a lot of money, the, the, the people at the bottom of the pyramid really suffered. Some of them suffered from unemployment. Some of them suffered from lack of access to goods. Some of them had to go back. You all remember the reverse migration. So what did we do during that time? We had many people working on our real estate construction sites. My CEO called me the same evening I took a decision. Nobody is going out. Give them free food. Give them a daily allowance. They will stay. It is our responsibility. To, though they are our contractual employees, it's our responsibility to take care of them. It was a spur of the moment decision. But as a leader, I had to take it. And we were one of the first to start our construction activity back when the government gave us permission. Why did it happen? Because you take, took care of your employees. You address their concerns. You address their insecurities. You gave them food, clothing, shelter. And they gave it back to you when we said, now we are ready to start. So really, when, you know, when there are surprises and, you know, what makes, when there are surprises, there's turbulence. When there's enough surprises, there are enough turbulences. And to take care of these surprises and turbulences, you know, I was reading a book by Gopala Krishnan. All of you must be knowing he's a very well-known author. He's, uh, he was past uh, a director in Levers. He was director of Tata Sons, worked very closely with Mr. Atan Tata. And he said, the way we are vaccinated against the COVID-19 to protect ourselves against any uncertainty from the COVID, we need a people's shield vaccine for our corporates. And what is people's shield? People's shield is something that you, under, you need to understand the emotions, you need to understand the insecurities, concerns. You have to generate a dialogue. You have to generate a debate. There's nothing that one opinion is final. You know, create that comfort zone. Create that environment. As a leader, you need to, especially during uncertain times, you need to create that environment in a corporate, in a company, saying that healthy debate is welcome. Try and justify your viewpoint. Create more and more opportunities for young managers, middle-aged managers, old managers to come out and say that, you know, let's do this together and let's invite different views because different views help us. At the same time, be very highly performing. You need to be very, very highly performing in business. Get the discipline amongst your employees because there's also a con to the chairman or the head or the leader being exposed to all sections of managers. They may just say that the hierarchies don't count anymore. So you need to find that fine balance between giving freedom to your employees to express their views, to come out with innovative ideas, and at the same time, get discipline and protocol in work. Because at the end of the day, we all need to get our work done. And the last thing, I think the way we adopted technology, I think leadership counted a lot in it. Overnight, people who are not at all used to working online, had to adopt through whatever means it is. You know, overnight we said, when my guy told me, I said, let's buy 50 laptops. So he said, are you sure, sir? I said, yes. We will take this call consciously because our work has to move on. Nobody can come to the office, at least for a month. He said, sir, what after a month? I said, let them get used to working. We'll give them, at the same time, you know, we'll give them an option in the future, even if things normalize. Suppose if somebody's wife is not well, or somebody's husband is not well, or somebody's child is not well, somebody's parents are not well, let them work from home. You know, that's the kind of flexibility we could give to our employees 
and say that this is how we could, you know, probably make much more effective use of time. And many of the companies today are saying, let's work part-time home and part-time in the office. Of course, physical meetings are important. I am one of the firm belief that unless you shake a hand, a business deal can't be done seriously. Unless you see the employees in their eyes, you cannot feel the vibe as to what's going on in an organization. So physical meetings are important. But today, because of the use of technology, we are in a much better situation that if push comes to shove, we can work from home. Finally, I would like to just say that, you know, temperament is very, very important. I think at the end of the day, what you need is the temperament to work as a leader. Okay. Insecurities will happen. Volatility will happen. And I was reading something which I really caught my attention. That's the take home for you guys. And I'm just sharing it with you. Uncertainty and volatility are normal. You must learn to love it. And that's a part, probably a part of your business education in the future. If things are stable for too long, start to worry. You know, if things are not moving anywhere, and if you are becoming complacent, you need to start to worry. So, you know, things have to be volatile and things have to be uncertain to make opportunities, to spot that opportunity and see how many startups have done well so much in COVID-19. You know, I invested in a company called Licious about three or four years back. And today it's become a unicorn in less than three years. So you could imagine the kind of opportunities that can come in volatility and the uncertainty. Firms that survive and thrive own and control the narrative about where they are going and why will always survive. So that's why the focus needs to be to thrive own and control the narrative about where they are going. One has to have a vision. One has to have a backup plan for the vision. One has to implement that vision with all cuts, you know, with commitment, with this and that's where the leadership matters leadership really matters it can hurt as well as help so you need a right leader if you have a wrong leader it can hurt you as well and credibility matters a lot at the end of the day don't sacrifice your credibility for short-term profits i'm a strong believer in this i don't know how many of you all know but i left the mining business in its very heydays of uh, profits and people thought that I am a fool. And probably that was the right way to think. And a lot of people came and said, what have you done? You know, you've blown away the legacy of your forefathers. So for a moment, I thought I was in a dilemma. For many months, I said, I've done the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, I thought that my credibility mattered. And somewhere down the line, that business was losing the way it was done by the earlier mine owners. And I said, money is not everything. Let's look at new businesses, but we will exit this. And, you know, the rest is now we need to rethink on mining. I hopefully think that, you know, there's going to be option of leases and mining will start. The last thing I want to say is don't, you know, Indian society shuns failures. I don't know why. Banks don't look at you properly when you fail. Society shuns you. Uh, if you don't do well, between two siblings, the parents shun you. I mean, this is something that we have to say that mistakes are seldom fatal. Mistakes help you learn. I failed in so many projects of mine and in every failure, I've learned something. You must have the humility to admit that you failed. You must have the humility to admit that I will analyze the failure and then work out a backup plan as to how to not repeat. So I think, you know, Acceptance of failure and analyzing it is very, very important. And last but not the least, never be arrogant. Arrogance is deadly. It can destroy leadership and it can destroy an organization. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, may I take up a few questions? Sure, yes. Uh, yes, sir. So the first question, is do you believe the political leadership offsets the good hard work by corporate leadership your opinion uh i think you know this is a very personal question but i think just as there are good corporate leaders there are bad corporate leaders and just as as there are good you know bad political leaders there are very good political leaders 
I think that, you know, my own experience of meeting very good political leaders and, you know, for uh, good order's sake, let's not name whether it's corporate leaders or whether it's political leaders. I have seen some very sharp political leaders who have done phenomenal good to their own state, phenomenal good to the nation. You know how much, uh, probably, how much good has happened in the corporate world in the last five years, you know. We've got the IBC, that is the, you know, bankruptcy uh, charter. Uh, we've done the coal auctions in the most transparent manner. Now they are looking at other auctions. So I think, you know, political leadership also acts positively. And uh, there are very good bureaucrats. There are very good politicians. There are very good corporate leaders. But at the same time, all of you all know, and I don't need to need, that some of the corporate leaders have also cheated and, you know, sort of made their co companies bankrupt. So I think leaders are, top leaders and good leaders are very hard to find, but they are prevalent in every, every section of society. That's, that would be my comment. Thank you, sir. Uh, associated to the similar uh, question, uh, you know, this argument uh, or this particular uh, dilemma is always there whether leaders are born or are they made. So what would you say, sir? Are they born or they are made? Uh, you must have a little bit of leadership instinct in you. But I don't think that a leader is born and then you don't make any attempt to say that I'm not a born leader. I think at the end of the day, everything should be backed up by hard work, passion, commitment, integrity and believing in your values. I think if you start cultivating whatever I told you earlier, that trust in yourself, stick to your values, be empathetic, be empathetic, not only to your employees, but also to society in general. These are all qualities of a good leader. And who can't be a good leader? You know, look at, look at the Indian corporate ranking 20, 30 years back and look at Indian corporate ranking today. You see a sea change. These leaders have emerged out of nowhere. Look at somebody like uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma of Paytm. Look at somebody like, uh, you know, uh, the Paytm founder, you know. So, you know, we, we have to believe in ourselves first and we have to work extremely hard towards achieving our vision and goal. So I would say that while some of the instincts can be born leaders, but I think you can definitely be a good leader by practicing all the values and the trust issues and by working hard yourself. Thank you, sir. So like you have uh, mentioned in your talk uh, today that uh, there is a changing ecosystem, a lot of things are turbulent and uh, there is uncertainty uh, in business today. Uh, so do you think that with this level of uncertainty, there is also a shelf life for the leaders and that shelf life is coming down rapidly for leaders? That's a very, very good question. Uh... I have been introspecting that for myself, uh, for my own group, uh, because I have worked in the group uh, and I've headed my group for the last more than 25 years. And uh, I genuinely believe that after every 10 to 15 years, uh, there should be a leadership change. Uh, for the simple reason, it's not to say that you are bad or he's bad or she's bad. You need change in ideas. So from that perspective, I think every organization is to evolve because the shelf life of companies is really coming down. If you don't adopt new technologies, if you don't adopt new ways, if you don't adopt new methods, if you don't adopt new, if you don't spot new opportunities, there is a very, very high likelihood that our organization can fail. And what I'm saying is, I'll just give you a small example. I pursued my MBA 25 years or 27 years back. And you are pursuing your MBA today, all the students. So I would say you are much better equipped than me. Now, how much you use your MBA and to what extent you use your analytical skills to run your business successfully is your effort. But to some extent, I believe that leaders can't stay in the chair forever. They have to make way for new ideas to flow in. And to that extent, I believe the shelf life of a leader has to be limited. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, as you are a leader yourself in the educational sector or in the 
educational industry and uh, you hold education very dear to you uh, is what we know about you as well so one question related to the education uh, front is now uh, as with the example of phd is made compulsory for teachers to be a part of uh, you know the education sector and uh, this has been done to improve the quality so what is your opinion on this whether this will really enhance the quality of teaching by making phd as a mandate uh to get uh, regularized or to be permanent uh, in organizations see if you look at uh, i mean i'm not only saying in india if you look at worldwide you know the quality of research conducted in a university or institution determines the credibility of the institute and the credibility of the faculty so i am a firm believer that yes you need quality quality research to be published you need quality research to be generated in a university and the faculty members have to do it so my simple answer would be yes if you want to reach the center to become a center of excellence i think what is really required is innovative research what is really required is deep rooted research on a topic that is very very dear to you you are passionate about it's your topic of expertise and i think that will definitely help not only the faculty member you know to improve his teaching skills because i of course i'm not saying that research is the only component that will help a faculty to be top class in addition to that he or she has to make an effort for her own training i think most important part apart from research is also the training aspect you know to make the lecture very interesting for the students you need to have a particular articulation you need to have particular sense in how you want to teach a subject to make it more interesting but to answer your question yes i feel research should be an integral part of faculty to be eligible to teach in institutes of repute like the goa university okay uh, i have another question uh, in the chat box which is covid management in goa uh, was a chaos which three areas do you think the government could have worked on to improve the situation so let me put it in this perspective i think you know it was a very very uncertain time it was a very very uncertain period i'm not saying that government did everything right and you know they were absolutely right and you know whatever happened is we blame the natures of law but to give credit to them there was a lot of hard work from frontline workers from doctors from nurses you know the kind of effort that they have put in to save our fellow citizens has been exemplary having said this this is the best time to introspect as to where we've gone wrong whether it's in provision of infrastructure whether it's the way we managed our hospitals whether it is the way uh, we manage the logistics part of it so i think these should be learning lessons to take back home so that in the eventuality of any other crisis i'm not so saying only about covid but you know once in 50 or 100 years if you've seen the past there is some health crisis or the other we should make these learning experiences and learn from there so that we overcome these bottlenecks so that's what i'm saying that whether it's in terms of hospital management whether it's in terms of supplies of essential commodities whether it is in terms of because at some stage the citizens became so nervous because you are not getting milk you are not getting your essential supplies and you know that was it it happened to everyone it was not only you know happening to a few people so i think that yes there is a lot of learning to be done but just to say that the government has done everything wrong i mean i wouldn't say that there were a lot of things that the government also stepped in and i think look at our vaccination program you know i must commend the national government and if you look at the way we learned during our second phase i don't want to name countries but much more developed countries are facing much worse crisis than india at the moment so i think it has been a mixed bag and i think the way to look at it positively is to learn from it and overcome your bottlenecks and deficiencies thank you sir uh, yes yeah. yes sir uh, So, for compliments for a fantastic talk, uh, 
I just wanted to take that uh, the question I think which was asked with respect to PhD and research uh, by Teja uh, was more from the point of view that how as a leader, how do you believe that making something compulsory or forcing it, forcing people to do it, uh, uh, will it improve on the quality or will it mar the quality? So, for example, when I make it compulsory for a person to be appointed. He might be a great teacher, but does not does not like doing a, a formal PhD kind of a thing. Uh, would we lose as a system a good teacher by then? Say for example, a person from industry. And typically, I'm looking at it from an MBA kind of a course, where I have got a very good industrialist who can make a fantastic teacher. But because I want, I have to have a PhD compulsory. I'm losing on a quality. I'm just uh, looking at it as your thought as a leader. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So uh, good, good question, Nilesh, and you know it's uh, very difficult to answer. But I'll give you some of my impressions and reactions. It's like you know I tomorrow go to hire a CEO for my pet cook company, and I put there that you know I need an MBA and I need an engineering background, and I need so much of work experience and I need this and I need that. In very extreme situations, will I make an exception? You know. Uh, I would stick to my core definition of what my CEO should comprise as. So I would apply the same benchmarks uh, to sort of, you know, the teaching faculty saying that he or she has to be of a particular standard. And how do I judge that? You know, what you say is if the lecture has, you know, if somebody as a business leader or as any other leader, as a social leader, you know, if he's so good, let him come as a guest faculty, you know, I would, but I would not break my basic norms saying that if my institute has to have credibility, then that kind of research is required to be appointed as a faculty. So, you know, it's a mixed bag, but I think there must be some level of certain standards, however good you are in your teaching or however good you are in, you know, expressing your thoughts and conveying it to students. And you could always have a separate sort of a category for them. But if I had to run a university, I would say that this is the bare minimum that is required. And I think in every every uh, top university of the world, I think PhDs are a must uh, for teaching in, you know, in that particular line of whatever, you know, area of uh, work that he is doing. So I personally believe that is required to some extent. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll take up the next question that uh, in the talk as well, you mentioned about technology and how technology during the COVID times helped you to connect with your uh, staff employees. So there's a question that says that will technology make organizations and world flat and eliminate the hierarchy and roles in the years to come? Uh, as I said, I think I've partly answered this question in my address. Uh, you know, you need to be very careful when you say that the world is going to be flat. Uh, at the end of the day, a leader or an owner or a promoter can only do so much. And he has, to, he has to rely on his team to get work done. You know, tomorrow, even if I dream and I say I'm the only one in the company who is responsible and I want to do this and do that, tomorrow, if all my employees resign, I will be zero again. So having said this, to some extent, Hierarchies in management is required. It's my viewpoint because at the end of the day, I can manage only so much of bandwidth. You know, there can be only four people reporting to me, five people reporting to me, 10 people reporting to me. But at the same time, what technology has helped you to do is locate interesting people in your organization who have the spark in their eyes, who have clear wisdom, who have clear thought. So at least I can then go back to my superior and tell to his superior and say, who reports to me, I like this boy or I like this girl. Why don't we encourage her, you know, to get into higher job responsibilities? Maybe she can go and get an MBA, power herself with more education. So those kind of things, I think technology has helped. But if you say that, you know, technology will just, just eliminate hierarchies of management, I personally believe it will not be a very good thing. Uh, while you have great advantage of working, you know, for example, many companies have said that two days in a week, you will not, you'll work from home or you can go to your farmhouse, you can work, 
so long as you get your work done it's fine while those are wonderful things but i think to some extent to get work done to get accountability uh, to get protocol to get discipline in the work style hierarchies of management are required so with your permission uh, can i take the last question for the sure. day uh so there's a student who wanted to know that you mentioned about failures and that we do not address failures uh, appropriately so he's asking that um, how did you overcome the failures and how did you manage to overcome the failures but then he wants to know your experience so as i said uh, you know culturally in india failures are not very well accepted this is my personal opinion you may beg to differ from me uh how i encountered failures is that i tried to take it in my stride first and said that okay i failed in this i took a deep breath i swallowed and i said that let me analyze why i failed so i think analyzing and introspecting becomes a huge part of the failure analysis process and how do you do it there are two three ways of doing it one is go to the people that you believe in as your advisors go to the people who feel as a student it can be your faculty member it can be your you know head of department it can be your chancellor it can be anybody vice chancellor anybody or it can be your parents it can be your siblings so what i did was i have certain gurus that i believe who have helped me in my businesses who have given me the right advice so i analyzed myself and went put my thoughts down on paper and i said sir this is how i think i failed can you tell me what i could have done differently i think the first thing is I, as i said in my last thing that arrogance can be deadly okay first thing you have to say that i will not be arrogant about my failure okay and also don't lose patience you know i i dread to read headlines when you know people come go and commit suicide when they feel particularly in the academic front i think you know there are people who have not been able to get into good schools and they have done very well in their business I don't know how many of you follow Harsh Mariwala on Twitter, and once he said on Twitter, Harsh Mariwala runs a eighty thousand crore Marico business. Okay, he was not accepted in any U.S. business school. I think today he can fund five business schools, U.S. business schools together. How many of you all know Jack Ma of Alibaba was refused into Harvard Business School four times? So I think you know while it's great to study, and I'm I'm I must since you're a student, I must uh, sort of appeal to you to work very hard. and get the best out of your mba this is not be all and end all of everything you know so i think failure has to be analyzed it has to be taken in stride and the good part is you learn from failure so long as you've learned from a failure it's absolutely fine and that's what i did i i tried to analyze from my failures and i said okay never again what i did was wrong what i did was you know just uh, impulse reaction and i won't do it again. so it's it's a lot to do with self analysis and that people that you believe in could give you the right sort of advice thank you thank you very much sir and for such a wonderful talk and spending such a lovely evening with us uh, i now request uh, mr harsh to give the word of thanks on behalf of goa business school I take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to our chief guest, Shri Shrinivas Dempo, bringing an informative talk and enlightening us all on the topic leadership challenges in turbulent times. We have learned that even when other aspects of business are uncertain, leadership is enduring. Also, during the COVID times, besides all the other business strategies. it was it is the top leadership that made the difference to sail through the testing uh, testing time i would uh, thank you so much sir for the, such an informative talk and i would also like to thank the students for being present and participating in the talk thank you thanks it was a real pleasure to talk to all of you and i you know i particularly enjoy talking to students as i believe that uh, you know they are going to be the future leaders of this country whatever field they do thank you so much Professor Nilesh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Depo. Thank you very much thank for you, accepting sir. our invitation. Thank Thanks, Nilesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, sir. It was wonderful talk. We all enjoyed. It. Students thank must have enjoyed much better, better than us. Sir. Thank you. So it was really wonderful. Thank you.
Thanks for having me, Dr. Sudarshan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it okay to disconnect? Yes, right, sir. sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you. Yeah, thank you.